Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Orbit Live event. I'm so excited to welcome two amazing fantasy authors, Tasha Shuri and Sui Davies Okamboa. Tasha Shuri is the author of Empire of Sand and Realm of Ash. The Jasmine Throne, the first book of her brand new fantasy trilogy, will be out next month. Sui Davies Okamboa is the author of the Nomo Award winning David Mogo God Hunter. Son of the Storm, the first book in his brand new fantasy series, is available now. Links to buy Tasha and Sui's books can be found by clicking the green button below the video. Throughout the event, Tasha and Sui will be answering your questions. You can submit any questions you have by clicking the Ask a Question link below the video. We already have some questions, so feel free to ask more. You can also vote on your fellow attendees' questions so that the questions with the most votes will be likely answered first. The event is being recorded and you'll be able to access the replay using the same Crowdcast link you used to enter the event. And now without further ado, I'll turn the event over to Tasha and C. Take it away. So hello, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> hello. Welcome. So C, before we before we actually came on screen, um, mm. we were asking what it's like for you in your in your debut launch days. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I know that life has been very busy, but how have you found the whole experience of um, people reading your book and it being out in the world and everything? Yeah, surreal, isn't it? Um, it's always, <laughs> always sort of like <laughs> this whole thing where, you know, something you've created has like taken up on a life of its own, it has a bit of a, you know, it becomes its own thing, especially like when I see people react to the characters or respond to things. Um, and sometimes I did give, say, thoughts to something. I And then someone would come up and be like, you know, this was really like poignant or like this really hit home. And I and, and I end up realizing that, you know, that, you know, that little time that I put into, you know, making that thing and ended up being very like useful uh, or like it ended up being this very big thing. So yeah, it's sort of like really, it's equal parts. It, it feels like a spiritual experience in many ways, <laughs> uh, equal parts, um, you know, exciting, fun, but also like exhilarating, uh, anxiety inducing. So it's like all the good things um, rolled into one. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean like about a spiritual experience like you've created this thing and then when other people engage with it i mean the ones who engage positively which is the only ones you meant to know about um <laughs> they sometimes people have this real moment with your work which like where they have such an emotional reaction and i think for for authors like us who are writing non-western kind of fantasy drawing in in parts on things that we've grown up with or or read about mm -hmm. um it hits different for people because it's often people who are reading our work haven't seen that before and maybe it's also something from their background and that always like really touches me and I know when I picked up Son of the Storm that like I just thought oh my god I've never read anything like this before and it was just wonderful but yeah yeah just really cool yeah I can I completely I completely see that um when I read um Empire of Sand the first time I it was like that too I was like this is very and you know different from everything anything i've seen oh, and i remember like seeing <laughs> i remember seeing um some videos where um I, th um I think it was like on facebook at, at the time i think where you like gave some um facts about some folks from like um some notable folks from like the mughal um india um yeah, era yeah, and all of that yeah and i was like oh wow i you know so i mean it's fantasy and i was engaging with that book as fantasy but at the same time, I was thinking about how all these things that often ordinarily wouldn't have like come to light in this way, at least, mm. are suddenly like front and center, right? As a result of this tangential or adjacent work. So um, I guess I can like I can see that experience, like readers having that, especially if they come from these spaces themselves, and they're like, "Oh, this is something that I never thought would make its way into this space." But like here it is, and here it is being itself unashamedly, you know? So I, yeah, yeah. so I think okay. that's part of the spiritualness of that experience, yeah. Oh, I really like that. I've never thought of it that way, but yeah. I mean, oh, I I do kind of, what I really like, what I don't like is when people read the books and they go, I feel like this taught me something about Mughal history because I go, I'm <laughs> teaching you so many wrong facts about Mughal history. Exactly, yeah. Um, 
and with the Jasmine Throne, it's even worse because I've I've kind of mashed history together. So it's mm. and mythology, and so it it doesn't really resemble any particular historical period. Mm -hmm. But I do like when people read it and they go, "I want to know more about the original sources or things that inspired this," and they go kind of yeah. like investigate that. So I know with like the Jasmine Throne, I I took a lot of influence from a lot of the Hindu epics that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. um, which come from my religious background, but I also consider mythology because they they have that kind of dual purpose or, or kind mm. of power. Um, but I was really curious what what things or what influences you put into Son of the Storm because it felt like, to me as someone reading it, it felt like you'd used a lot of different influences and you'd kind of led them together to make something new, but I wasn't mm -hmm. really sure what those mm -hmm. things might be. Yeah, I mean, it sounds exactly what, like what you're describing <laughs> um, with um, the Jasmine Throne as well. That's pretty much what I did. Um, none, none of it is anything on its own. Mm -hmm. um, all of it is something completely new, you, you know, either by virtue of how much um, is made up in the story and also by how much layering of various things ha has been done to the extent that none of it re re you know, really re resembles anything that has existed at any point. Yeah. Um, someone literally asked me a question the other day, um, if one of the groups I had in the novel was um, inspired by the Dora Milaje, right, from Black Panther. And and the reason they asked that is because one of the groups was like an all-female warrior type um, people, but it wasn't like very, I didn't like place it front and center. It just happened to be one thing that was mm -hmm. present in the book. And and it's, it struck me as an interesting because the Dharma Milaje were actually based on another, an actual group that already did actually exist. Um, but like, I think for the first time, or at least for this person, they were managing to like draw these lines and like, oh, I've seen this thing somewhere, but like the, the closest place I can think of is like Black Panther. Um, and then now I'm seeing something, not the same thing, but it looks similar or or at least has some overtones here does this mean that there's you know something that did exist of this form and the answer is yes but i like that now like there's this pop culture reference where you can actually start to see various representations of this one thing and feel like it it it, it can become its own thing that doesn't that doesn't like need to how do i explain this like it doesn't need to be stay as true or whatever to something it just needs to exist as possible representations of this i know yeah 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 so i um i like that that is happening already and like this is a small step these are small steps but like we're getting there um and that's actually the question i wanted to ask you you've already asked it which is how do you balance that right how do you balance like writing fantasy that's inspired by all these things but also making sure that you're not doing the, you're not trying to be like historical or like, um, you know, telling an anthropological re retelling or something or yeah, something that's yeah. already existed, right? Like how do you balance creating the new thing so that the full work stands on its own? I, okay, to be, to be totally honest, the, I, I struggled with that in my first books, but what helped me with, um, with the Jasmine Throne and what I think probably helps quite a lot of authors from different backgrounds is that there already are sort of a historical um, narratives in like Indian culture. And that sounds really vague, but what I mean is like um, that kind of religio mythology that I grew up with was always on my television. My grandma loved it. She would watch it on ZTV, which if there are any Indian people here, they will know. Um, and it was, you know, kitsch but kind of exciting but you know um retellings of, of stories from the Mahabharata and the Ramayana and the Krishna Leela etc and um although they are meant to or if you are of that faith they're real and they happened um they kind of exist outside of time everybody dresses in a specific way which is the way that the costumes just happen to be and you know um the magic just works the way it works because that's how it works and it's it's comes from its own kind of tradition, but it's outside of real history. It's it's decontextualized, so it's fantasy essentially. Um, though obviously it's it's religious and it is important and meaningful. I'm trying to count, disclaim myself a little bit here, but I think you see something similar in a lot of like um, 
when you look at Chinese fantasy dramas as well, that they draw from real history, but they exist outside of historical time. And that's what I think a lot of fantasy does um, in, in the Western tradition. So with something like the Jasmine Throne, all I did is I kind of gave myself permission to be as ahistorical as some of the things I grew up watching. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that meant I could take little bits of history and mash them together and mm -hmm. create something new. Because, you know, when you read like um, a lot of, I guess, more traditional fantasy, more traditional Western fantasy, it can draw from all sorts of bits of history, like mm -hmm. the medieval and the early modern and the Renaissance have all had a baby and there it is and there's a dragon in it and that's mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. Um, and nobody questions that. So <laughs> yeah. I was like, let let me give myself the same permission that yeah. other authors would have. That's that's a good point. Yeah, because because I, I think one of the one of the I'm not sure if I'll call it a burden, but it kind of can be um, mm. is like when you're telling this, when you're drawing right on these histories, but also at the same time trying to be ahistorical because you're telling the fantastic experience that is supposed to exist out of this historical experience or, or time or place or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there's that, there's that possibility because this thing isn't, hasn't proliferated to the degree where um, deviations will be acceptable as fiction mm. right or, or fictionalized there's this there's always there's always that space um around that work where folks would be like mm, does that really you know does that really is that really what it was like um and of course taking which is completely out of, not the real question to be asked yeah, because yeah. it's not even saying not real. that that's yeah. what it is right um and i think part of the thing is the fact that um, maybe part of it is the fact that um, there's that there's always that tag that tag that says, for instance, that this is fancy based on West African empires, and that's why I was very clear from the beginning because um, we, want, we wanted to pitch some of the storm. Uh, one of the questions I got asked was, uh, you know, what will be what what do I want to say is like the strongest inspiration in terms of where I was drawn from, and that's a fine. Um, but I, I was very particular not to say I drew a lot from the Benin Empire, which is which I which is where I really started, but that's mm -hmm. not really where I ended up. And I was sure to say this was like West African empires, plural, because it's not one thing. And then yeah. also it has very specifically West African overtones, um, but not necessarily is a representation of West African history to any degree. And and despite that, there's always there's you know there will always still be people who be like, um, yeah, are you sure you know that this is as you know true to X Y Z as possible? Um, and it's it's always interesting how that like maybe ends up coloring how folks will like, like approach the work. Um, but at the same time, I said I, I think of it as like um, is it double edged sword where it's like on one hand yeah, it's like doing the thing, yeah. yeah, bringing the the work out to um, those who like, like ordinarily might not have really engaged with work of these, you know, work carrying these overtones in the way they are. But at the same time, you know, all these questions come up and then you have to like, you know, um, deal with them or like um, at least nudge people and be like, hey, that's really not what we're doing here. So <laughs> I, I always think it's kind of, um, I've thought a lot about the way when you're writing certain types of fantasy, you're you're engaging in a narrative tradition, mm -hmm. and that narrative tradition has done a huge amount of work for you. So um, you can you can say certain words like I don't know halberd, I guess, or um, or great grief, on, grief on, or like or, you know, yeah, like, or you know, yeah, yeah, you can exactly. Say these words, and and a reader will know what you mean and will go along with you. Whereas if you know, if I write an Indian inspired fantasy and I say um, she pulled her chunni over her hair or she adjusted her pallu, or, you know, her silver kameez didn't fit. I'm, I'm just going with clothes here. I don't know why this is the theme I've picked. Um, the reader might go, hang on, what's that? And it takes them out of that fantasy and mm -hmm. they don't have that instant narrative tradition to fall on. So then you're sitting there thinking, do I explain to the reader what this is? Do I give them this context? Or do I trust them to gather context from, from what they're reading? And mm -hmm. that's like another layer of stuff yeah. that you have to deal with on top of everything else. Um, yeah. 
And then when you're bringing in like historical influences, even when you're taking it out of history, you think, yeah. do I have to explain how my society functions and its structures yeah. because it doesn't follow the kind of, um, let's say the monarchical God King structure that you'd expect in a fantasy novel. Just, yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Those were, I guess these are all questions I had to contend with as well. Um, and because I'm a, I'm someone who, uh, one of what I one of the things I've decided as an author, right, to do with my work is to err on the side of verisimilitude to represent what uh, seems most true to me and and mm -hmm. what comes out of where I come from. And so, in terms of say food, um, for instance, right, which can be very localized, and I will want to say a certain food, but then I realize this might not be, you know, like if I was thinking globally, how would this be? you know, thought about. I, I have to think, I have to stop actually. And so like the, the act of having to stop and think about that at all is already a thing, right? Yeah, um, it's a little, uh... Yeah, it's like its own thing. Uh, but then having to then also decide which way to go is also a very tough decision. And this is a decision you're making literally every two, every three pages. <laughs> um, uh, and I think I'm getting better at deciding um, what things to like, you know, is this the anchor I'm going to go down with or <laughs> is this the, I know is this the one I'm going to let go of, you know? Um, and then of course you do that on the personal level, you take that to the editorial table and that is that you have to do that again at the editorial table. And then when book comes out, you have to do that at the reader level. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's one of the, um, and you've had to do it in urban fantasy with David Mogo, God Hunter, yep. and in epic fantasy, which exactly. is two different ways of having yeah, to deal with yeah. this. Yeah. With the urban fantasy it was actually, easier because mm -hmm. Google could solve a lot of problems. That's um, true. Yeah. True. And so I was like much more um, like I, I went w much harder with like, I'm going to leave this as is because mm -hmm. it can be found. Um, but with epic fantasy, I was like, well, most of the stuff in this world is new. So it will be maybe more difficult to differentiate between what is a new fictional word and what is probably an existing word that's being borrowed on. Um, so, so I was like way more like leaning, like, all right, I'm just going to explain how this particular thing or word or whatever works within this world. And yeah. then you can work from there. Um, so actually the decision making process is much in that way is much, much easier with, um, epic fantasy, I guess. Um, I've just looked at the time and I think maybe we should look at the questions. So I'm just going <laughs> to, <laughs> sorry. Um, no, it's fine. The, um, the first, the question that's been most top voted is, is one I kind of think we've answered, which is given whatever historical research was required, coupled with creating the rules of the new world, you overlaid over that. Mm -hmm. What was the world building process like for you both? And I do kind of think we've answered that. Yeah, I think that's yeah. pretty much what we were talking about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I am interested in the second question, actually. Um, which is how much input did you have over the design of your covers? And I'm interested in that because your cover is stunning. Like, <laughs> and you must agree because you have it on your wall. I can see it right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The the artist sent me this actually. Oh, um, wow. Uh, and it was the process. So I would say I had way more, um, way more input in this cover than say I had with David Mogo. Yeah. Um, and David Mogo's David Mogo cover was like really dope as well um and and I, I didn't have any problems with it it just landed fully you know mm -hmm. finished on the table and I was like that's great this one also did but um there was like more thought that went into it and and I always like to tell the story because it, it a lot of it is unconventional pretty much as the book is um so like in epic fantasy for those who are probably attending they're used to this um, Character-based covers are not as commonplace. Um, commonplace where you have like a person, but if you've noticed, like Orbit has started to veer in away from that, and like the literally this year, there's like a bunch. All of, of us, yeah. yeah. It's like all of <laughs> us have like character-focused covers, and and that has given a bit of. Um, it has given I don't know maybe a bit of understanding about what you're going to mm. in in a sense because like the whole i think selling point of epic fantasy covers being like very expansive is to give the idea that the world and everything inside it is expansive right yeah. um so i think 
uh, what happened is we tried it. We did try that, right? That was that that is tradition. And 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 my editor Nivia sent me all these covers and was like, "This is what we've done so far. Uh, what style do you think works for Santa Storm?" And I was like, "Well, I don't think any of these work, especially because a lot of the landscapes that were being shown to me didn't fit." kind of landscape I was looking at, right? Where I was mm -hmm. thinking more like, you know, rainforest, mountains, um, and none of that was there, you know? Yeah. And I was like, okay, so can we try something different because this isn't working? And and she kind of agreed. She was like, yeah, this isn't really working. Um, and and I was like, why don't we just do the character and cover thing that, you know? And she was like, yeah, that's actually not a bad point. Even if like, she made the point that it, it, it tends to happen more often in YA that yep. you'd have characters on the cover. And she was like, yeah, I don't think we need to be like bound by any rules. Let's give it a shot. Uh, and so we said, all right, we're gonna go with a character thing. And and it just went from there, we got the artist and then they asked me to put together like a package, you know, what does the character look like? Um, you know, so I was like very descriptive. I was like, all right, I'm gonna tell you everything from the earrings to the, the clothing, the, the wrappers, how they were tied, what kind of jewelry, uh, hairstyles, everything. Um, and then I had to pick an actor reference. Um, and Which I, I actor did you pick? Did I you didn't pick? actually pick an actor. My wife did pick an actor. Eventually. Which, okay, which actor did your wife pick? I, I really want to know. So she picked an actor called Luca Sabat, who I think is a is a character um, is an actor in this in a show called Grownish, which she watches and I don't. But okay. like she she just like completely picked. Uh, him out of it and I was like okay this actually really is a good reference for the character because um, I couldn't seem to like really think of anyone I could pick up but she did and then they ended up using that as the the reference although when the character did come out someone told me that um, the, the the character looked like Rihanna what no they were not, they were not wrong Honestly, they were not wrong. Do you genuinely wrong. think? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm... Well, there is a there is a particular photograph of Rihanna that looks exactly like this. Literally, like the 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 gaze, the everything's like. I was like, wait, see, hold I'm up. gonna have to see this photo. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to post a comparison I will, somewhere. I, so we it is. I, I think it is on Instagram. Like it is somewhere. Like like my Instagram page. I ended up posting it because I was like, wait, what? Um, that is so true, and it was true. So, like, if you okay. if you went up like my Instagram page, you would find it. There. Tade is in the comments. Tade Thompson, and he says, "I don't see Rihanna," and I'm with him on this <laughs> because I, I can't see it. I can't see it. I'm I, sorry. I couldn't either. I couldn't either until it was side by side. So um, I don't know how else, but maybe I'll just find the link <laughs> and put it like on <laughs> in the chats for folks to see for themselves. But yeah, it was like kind of it was a thing. Um, you know, everyone I, who's I here now it. is looking this up. Everyone's <laughs> gone up to Google All this. Right. So I'm going to post that link. This is it in the chat. Okay, I'm following uh, it as well. <laughs> Some are anyway. like, what are they doing? You know, yeah, no, I, know. I don't see it. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. Anyway, so yeah. Um, but this is what we ended up going with. Uh, it was the best thing, I think, decision that one of the best decisions we made um, because it really, it really did the job. I've I've seen nothing but love for this cover, and I remember when it came out, I was just like, "That is so cool! It's so it's so dramatic, you know." <laughs> yeah, I <It's> know. <laughs> and and I don't think, yeah, I don't think you look at it and you think YA by any means. There's something about it so. that's super epic, and yeah, I think you see that with like um the cover of the Unbroken as well. Even though they're very very different, they capture something about yeah. the character or the feel of the world. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and your 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 cover also has um, a character at the, you know, um, yeah, from, yeah, it does. Yeah, um, yeah how, how, how did I've that come about? Here. Wait, let me go. <laughs> um, so I'm actually like, I never have my book ready, and I'm actually prepared this time. So yes, there we Yay. go. Yay! Yay! Um, <laughs> the light's too bright, so you can't see it properly. <laughs> Um, yeah, so when I um, with my cover, I think it was actually more collaborative than I was used to as well. So. I was initially published by Orbit with Empire of Sand and Realm of Ash, and I thought they were very, um, they were very good with those covers. But those were not character covers. They, yes. you know, um, Lauren Panapinto and uh, my editor at the time, Sarah Glan, um, both asked me for references. Um, I didn't necessarily have input into what they were planning, mm. but they wanted to have references so they knew that the um, 
the look was correct, that they were using the right kind of um, symbology and symbology, yeah. yeah patterns and everything. And actually in the context of the Mughal era, which was where obviously, um, because it was an Islamic empire, even though the one in the book isn't, um, okay. they would not have used images of faces anyway. It made sense to use the kind of like patterns in the background behind the sword, I mean, the dagger. Um, but with um, the Jasmine Throne, my editor now, Priyanka, asked me if I had any ideas or if there were specific things that I wanted. Um, I knew that I could say I wanted X, Y, Z, and it may not happen because of course the cover is a marketing tool. Mm -hmm. um, but I said I would really love to have a figure on the cover and um, the logic in my head that I didn't necessarily articulate was that people really love being able to see somebody on the cover and they want to see people. I, I just knew that if I went into a bookshop and I saw an epic fantasy with an Indian woman on the cover, I would lose my mind. Mm -hmm. I would be so happy um, because you just don't see them. Right. Yeah, so yeah. Um, and I remember how excited I was about like Gideon the Ninth, just having like yes. <laughs> butch sword, you know, skeletons. Oh, I was so cool. Yeah, that was a good yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> it was so awesome. Um, and so I sent Priyanka a bunch of different references um, as well. And I was like, this is what um, Marlene looks like, one of the main characters. Um, she's, Marlene, yeah. this is what Priya looks like. This is some references to what, how they would dress and um, what the, what their skin tones would be because that was obviously important to me. Um, and I, and then I think the initial plan was that both Marlene and Priya would be on the cover. Um, and then that didn't work. So I gathered that they asked the artist um, who is Micah Epstein, I think, please forgive me if I got that wrong. Um, uh, if, I think they asked him to do both and it didn't have the right impact. So they changed it to just one woman. So it's just Priya on this one. And I think mm. the next couple will probably have Marlene is my guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. And um, I just, I just really loved it. I was like, I remember getting it in my inbox um, and just having a complete like emotional moment where I was like, I'm looking at um, an Indian woman in a sari who is queer on the cover of a fantasy novel. This is so cool. Um, and I still feel that way. I still think yeah. it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, I I, compl I think I think I agree with you there. Um, one of the things, one of the responses I've learned from covers is that there's an intensity of like looking at a character's face who's like also like gazing. It's like, it's, you know, I, I, I think there, uh, Tade is saying in the comments that, you know, when you're scanning through, it's like, you get to stop there and be like, oh, this person is like, you know, staring back at me or something. And I think that's part of like the unbroken is kind of very similar as well. It's like this character who's who looks poised, right, to do something. And I think yeah. that really, really does help. Um, I don't know how, um, why there's a, I would say, or I would think that there's more of a, uh, or let's say like character, character driven covers tend to do a lot of telling of the story before you yeah. even open the book in a way mm -hmm. in a way that's different right at least from um none but um so yeah yeah they do they do do some kind of storytelling yeah. um like i think with the unbroken you really get the sense of and i think sheree said this like um in a different interview that you get the sense of this it's a pose that you often see the kind of um grizzled male hero in mm. and this time we get to see to reign in that role and that's so cool and different um and I really like with Son of the Storm that you have like, is it Danso's? Is, is yeah. it? Yeah. You yeah, have Danso. his eye, you have his eye contact with you and his intensity. And it's nice to see that because when you actually read the book at the beginning, at least he's yes. so self-contained and he's keeping all of this stuff inside. Yeah. And then it's like, it's there on his face on the cover and it kind of leads you to where you're going to go. Yeah. Almost. I like, yeah. <laughs> That's that. Um, this, this was like really, um, I think one of our best choices, and and we're we're hoping to repeat it for books two and three um, with the other two characters, um, so we don't Are just we get, get the season. yeah. Ishemi. So we're gonna get we're gonna get Lilong and Shemi um, for books two and three. So I love Shemi so much. Like I I don't want to say too much because I don't want to spoiler it, but I, for everything that she does, I love her. <laughs> I will I will just say that. Yeah, and I think someone actually asked the question. Um, I don't remember when we get to that question. I would say something about Shemi, but I think it um, figures in one of the questions here. To be honest, the rate we're going, how many, how many questions are we going to do? Right, let, let's go. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's fine. We don't have to rush. We can just keep talking. Um, so um, I'm 
thinking because we just answered a question from that person, I'm going to move on to the one. Um, what is a random character fact that didn't make it into the first book? Hmm. So that is that's I think that's literally the question I was just talking about. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, go on. I want to hear what you what you're going to say. Well, mine is not character fact, um, mm -hmm. but Shemi was not even supposed to be a key character in the book at all. Um, but yeah, she's she so was, cool. Yeah, she, she ended up being the main character. She was just supposed to be a side character that, that just happened to appear like mm -hmm. a few times. Um, and I had already like written, you know, the what's the word like the character synopsis sort of. I'm like, yeah. okay, this is her arc, right? Um, this is her arc. Uh, and that's it. Her arc was like massively short. I was like, okay, this is what she's gonna do. Um, but then, of course, like sometimes you just put a character in an, in in a story. And one of the things I like to do is I like to think about who orbits characters. Mm -hmm. um, I'm like, who and what orbits this character? What kinds of spaces? What are their social spaces? And how do they engage with them? And what people are in those spaces? And how do those people engage with them? And the, one of the things I think I realized about Shemi was that when you, the minute I put her in the story, she seemed to like have exert so much force on like the characters around her in various ways, in a way that was just like impossible. Um, and her, the first character, of course, that she has this interaction with is Danso, but immediately I saw how much of a connection, right, they had uh, or, or a lack of it you know, in a, in, in a way that was so strong that it's its own connection, right? Um, I just, yeah, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I loved their first interaction in the book because it was both really intense and yet exactly not what I would have expected knowing their particular relationship. And yeah. it was, yeah, really good. <laughs> exactly. So, and, and I was like, this character exerts such a strong influence on Danso that it's impossible for her not to exert the same um you know, st strong impression on others around her. So I started mm -hmm. asking questions. So who are the people who orbit her then? You know, her her mother, her, you know, everyone else. And I guess it just showed that it wasn't just possible for her to stop there. And she ended up becoming like such a key major person. Um, so this, I guess this is the reverse of the question, who wasn't supposed to make it there or what wasn't supposed <laughs> to make it there and made it there. But uh, Shemi is like one, the major thing um, that I would say. In that case. Oh, uh, now I have to answer the question, which I'm not prepared for. Um, what is a major fact about the characters that didn't make it into the first book? There's so many characters. I don't know. Which one did I not say something about? Um, of course, when you've got a trilogy, there's always stuff you don't say about a character in the first book because you're saving it for another book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's true. So, so there's that. Um, but I can't say which ones that impacted um god I've, I've really gone blank i think that i'm just going to answer this by answering a different question that's in my head and um say that similar to you when i was writing the first book i ended up having a minor character that just kept growing and growing in significance and mm -hmm. actually a whole plot point happened that i had no intention of putting in the book mm -hmm. because of this character um mm -hmm. when anybody reads it it's Rao who is this prince who's just meant to be there, um, who was intended to just be there to support the main plot line. And, mm -hmm. and he is, he's still supporting it. Um, he's trying to get Princess Marlini, who's um, a captive in this ruined temple, out. And his job is to attempt this and probably fail. That was the initial plan. Um, and then I remember talking to my editor very early on and saying, well, I've called him Rao, and that's the name I've come up with, but it's not really a name, it's actually a surname. So it doesn't really make any sense for this to be his name. What if it's not really his name? What if his name is a secret and his name is a prophecy? Um, and and then kind of went from there. So that was that was really fun and not the answer to your question. And I'm sorry, um, but thought I'd share that fact. It's it's a useful fact anyway. <laughs> uh, so um, it's two questions. Not sure where to go next. So. We've answered a question about covers already, so perhaps mm. um, you pick, Sue. Do you want to say what the best thing about being published by Orbit is or what advice you would give to young black and brown writers who are currently in the querying process? Hmm. Um, are, are those two separate questions? Yeah, 
I'm, I just didn't know which one to pick. So <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, I can just do both. It's fine. Um, best thing about being published by Orbit, um, I think it's what someone has already said in chat. It's like getting to meet all these awesome writers and like everyone's like so supportive of everyone else's work. It feels very collegial in its approach. Mm -hmm. Is that is that the right word? But yeah, yeah it's more I like it's yeah, yeah, it's 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 very like often this kind of community is what you would find like outside in the wild west of author land. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you would like have to go make that space yourself. But yeah. like Ob Orbit manages as a publisher to sort of do that that for authors in a way that's very helpful, useful, because, mm -hmm. you know, it's like all of these books are coming out at the same time, right? Because um, all our books came out like within, between March and like June or something. Um, yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah, Broken was March, you're May, I'm June. Exactly. June. Yeah. And then there's a few other books coming out that I'm really excited about, like Hannah Wittens for the Wolf. and uh, Also in June, I think. I think. Yeah, that one's, yeah. I think she's out June the 1st and I'm out June the 8th. Hey, yeah, the yeah. next week. Yeah, I mm -hmm. remember that. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like that, you know, just having that being able to, um, uh, you know, enjoy being yeah. in the company of other writers. I think that's it. And, and enjoy the stories that they're putting out and enjoy the um, following them on that journey, especially as that journey is like part yours, um, because you share like a publisher, but at the same time, you also have your book orbiting the same space. Um, orbiting for orbit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> um, I think that's it. That's it, really. Um, and uh, let's see the advice for young black and brown writers in the querying process. Ooh, um, that's a heavy one. That's a that's, heavy that's one. That's a big one. Yeah. That's a. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna take a rain check on that one. I will that's answer fair. it still, um, but I will answer it. Uh, but I need to <laughs> really have, a, have a think. Have a think about it. Um, yeah, you you do you go with the uh, what's your best? What's what do you love about like? publishing with Orbit? Um, I, your answer, I, I really enjoy a lot of the meeting other authors at Orbit has been wonderful. I'm just trying to get out of this sun ray that's decided to come in my face. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the, yeah, the friendliness of them. And also mm -hmm. it's been really nice to be, to be published as part of a roster of, of quite a number of other writers of color and knowing that they have been done right by if that makes sense like mm -hmm. and to to work with such a cool oh god this sounds like i'm sucking up but a really cool range of publicists and editors who i think are genuinely really nice people <laughs> don't tell them i said that um <laughs> Um, so that's been really nice. I've, I've definitely enjoyed that. Okay, yeah, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> One of them is um, here. <laughs> they can hear me. Um, so that's been really nice. I mean, in the end, you know, publishing is a business and there are always ups and downs. And it's always a pleasure to be working in the industry with people that you actually admire or get on with and, yeah. and think have really care about doing right by your books. Yeah. Um, so that's something I really love about Orbit. Yeah. Um, I try and answer the other part of this. Um, so the advice I would give to querying black and brown writers is to please take this in the spirit I intend it. Query with the same confidence you would have if you were a white man who went to Oxford or Cambridge. <laughs> That's you know, there's nothing wrong with being a white man who went to Oxford or Cambridge, but you have been graced with a certain level of privilege by society, and that is very helpful. So if you are, you know, if you're a black or brown writer um, or if you are from a range of marginalized backgrounds, there are many, that things are going to be harder for you to succeed in this industry. You can be aware of that reality and still have confidence in yourself, because I think sometimes we internalize a level of like self-doubt because we internalize what society puts onto us. You don't have to do that. It's going to do it whether you internalize it or not you may as well embrace a certain level of confidence in your own work and your own ability um, and just carry that with you through the process. And that's, that's my advice. Yep. I, I think what I was trying to put together is something very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm saying this as someone who, for, when I queried, I, was, I wasn't even living in, in the US. I was still living in Lagos in Nigeria, which is, um, so like querying an American agent from Lagos is already tends to like want, put that, that like fear right of like 
would it be seen as good enough you know would yeah. would, would this be palatable and all of those questions would be like on on the you know something that you have to deal with but i guess one of the things i told myself very early on is that i was going to as much as possible tell the stories that i wanted to tell as close as possible that they resembled what would naturally come from me uh, and, and and me in sense of like the assimilation of all my identities as they intersect yeah many of these marginalized in various forms and underrepresented in various forms many of uh, some of these also privileged in some ways right and uh, and i was and i'm saying okay i want to make sure that i represent this as much as possible and don't have to compromise unless i want to for whatever yes. reason yeah yeah so so i think that's the energy that every you know author from either you know e both black and brown authors and authors from this range of like marginalized and underrepresented groups that's the energy right that they should go into the querying process with whatever challenges you face um um from as a result of you know just the regular querying process that everyone else faces take it with grace um whatever comes out of you know the fact that this is as you said, it's, you know, the the world we always remind you of like that, what you're bringing to the table has been historically marginalized and or represented, underrepresented. You always get that reminder. So sometimes in querying process, you might get that reminder. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the, the way you have learned to handle, um, so like going into that space with that energy will help you uh, deal with such situations when they are, uh, if they arise, hopefully they will not. Um, if they arise, you having that energy and like confidence in yourself as a person will be very helpful in dealing with that. I think 100%. I was talking to Hannah Witten, I think on Monday night. Um, so yesterday, yesterday. Um, mm. And she was saying, we were talking about, um, was it Friday? I, it doesn't matter. And we were talking about the importance of both having a lot of confidence in yourself, but also having humility because you're going to go through a lot of um, knocks and you're going to have to, reevaluate your work and you're going to have to edit your work and you're going to have to you know really alter what you do but mm -hmm. you need to have confidence in your work and in the quality of what you do and in who you are and what you produce and that's a really difficult thing to do yeah but yeah that's yeah the only way that, you can that do balance it. yeah that balance is really hard to hit um and sometimes you doubt yourself about like when or where exactly to employ um one or the other but i yeah. think it's like um, oh, being conscious, I think, is where the key, yeah, yeah like on the, having that consciousness that you need actually to think about how to employ one or the other is like what's important as opposed to right, maybe just like reacting, you know, in the easiest way that comes or like the first response that comes to you or whatever. I think we have very thoroughly answered that question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to have a look. And the next one is about what we like, what's it like for you to both have characters depicted on your covers? I kind of feel we've answered that. Yep, I um, think we have. So the next one is quite interesting. It's, would you rather have a film adaptation or a TV miniseries adaptation? And do you have any actors in mind? Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you're not good at thinking of actors because you've just revealed I that literally you're, just you're said, um, to pick the but, but, but guess what, like right after that, so this is what happened, right after that event, right, where I was asked to pick someone and I couldn't, and my wife ended up picking, I was like, yeah, this is never happening again, where I'll be stuck. So I then went and like fan cast my, and I have a list somewhere, I haven't looked at it in a while, but there's a list somewhere of like, this person would be a, you know, very good representation for this character. Um, and so probably if I was asked, I would probably pick from, from that. Um, so film or TV series? Hmm. I, I, I tend to be more of a TV series person. Um, but, but, and, and I think maybe, um, feature films just take, they're very different, um, like a very different ballgame from like TV series. Yeah. And I think TV series, the, maybe barriers to entry or um approaches to the making just have like 
I don't know. I just think they, for me, maybe they just have this amount of flexibility and especially when it comes to like budgets and stuff like that, right? They just have this amount of flexibility that will likely be, um, that, that are not, that are, that are not as high to scale, right? Um, that can be like, you can still get something good out of not all the best resources yeah. versus a feature film, um, I think, I think at least. Um, and so that's most the, more of the reason why. And probably because it gives you more space for character development. Oh yeah, definitely. It's, yeah. it's I think it fits better with something like a book format, like yeah. especially yeah. in epic fantasy, the amount of stuff you'd have to get into a feature film or cut exactly. to make exactly. it work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yep. Um, I'm not very good at casting my books. Um, <laughs> I think I've said before that I would love Amita Summon to be in it just because I think she's cool. That's it. Um, I don't know who she'd play, don't know what she'd do, but why not? Um, I'd love to see a lot of like um, British Asian actors get some work because um, historically they don't get much in England, so it would mm. be nice if they got something. Um, I actually, okay, this is a pet thing. This is something I really want. Um, I want more fantasy books to be adapted into radio dramas. Because I, I think people love audiobooks, right? A radio drama can create humongous special effects in your brain without needing like um, huge amounts of money. Yeah. And I would happily sit there and listen to a radio drama adaptation of, of many books I've loved. Like if they did that with the David Bard trilogy, I can't get out of this light. Yeah. Um, or or anything, or like the Poppy War, it would be so cool. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I would love I'm... to see that. Yeah. I'm with you on that one. I'm, with, I'm, I'm like seriously seconding that because during the pandemic, one of the series I listened to, I think it was called Wolver, uh, Wolverine, the, the Long Night. Um, I think there's a second one out called The Lost Trail. They're available on like Spotify, but they're from Marvel. Oh, cool. Okay, um, right, I'm done. And, and what they do is like have this very in like awesome acting um sound sound effects and like it's so real like i it literally i didn't have to be sitting in front of a tv watching them but i yeah. it felt like very very visceral and and the, i think part of what really makes sense i think um i also listened to this series homecoming before it became a tv mm -hmm. show um and that's how it, it was the same thing like i already i i i had that right in i had already experienced that and it felt like I was when I was watching the show. The show was a, the TV show was a different thing, but like it felt I had seen it before. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, that's kind of like I do agree with you. I don't think um, radio dramas, as they are pop popular, like on the BBC, are like very popular this side of the um, Atlantic. But um, I think I think there's room for that in like podcasts. Um, and I see. Think, I was um, going to say like uh, the Adventure Zone and stuff like that, or. Um, there are so many podcasts that are so massively popular and people do those like um, animations on YouTube for them and stuff mm. that I think there is an audience. It's just not being tapped into. If anyone's yeah. listening and wants to pay me money to make this happen. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's, and, and you, you do make a good point because there's the option too, of making that the alternative to actual audiobook readings yeah. of fantasy novel, right? Like no one says that you actually have to just make a one for one you know reading of the book you could make a dramatized reading of the book yeah. including sound effects sound effects uh, and that and yeah i do agree 100% with you on that i think we've got about 10 minutes and somebody's put the link to the wolverine podcast in yes there so yeah. people can have a look at that um yeah. <laughs> the next one's the question from orbit to wrap up but i don't know um I think Let's see. What's something you've read, watched, or listened to lately that you loved? That's what they're asking. But actually, there's loads of things that have, have two votes, so we could pick any of those. Um, yeah. Um, finding resources. Mm. About non-Western cultures. Oh, yeah, no, it's hard for everybody. It's not just for... Sorry, the question is, um, finding resources about non-Western cultures can be quite difficult for yeah. plebe... Is it plebeians? Is that how you say it? Or plebeians? It doesn't I, matter. You, you know <laughs> I mean. um, like me, are there any books that you can recommend that you used for research or would just feel would be a good starting point for more diverse research? Um, I think it depends on what story is being told. Yeah, it's like every yeah. other. It's like every other thing. If you were writing a story about like on underwater 
fish, you would find some research on specifically that. I think I think though that the key thing is not fixating on the exact point of ingress into the story being the research. Yeah. Right. I think that's it. Um, it's like what story do you want to tell? And then maybe ask yourself when you have decided to tell this story, what parts of that story require research, mm -hmm. um, especially mm -hmm. to the depths that you're, to the extent that you're borrowing from it and the depths to which you're going to examine um, whatever you're borrowing or like make use of. Um, and yeah, and find, I, I think your library is really, I, I ended up even using some stuff from the library uh, at my university in Arizona here just for Son of the Storm. I didn't think I was going to, but like I ended up finding some resources there. Um, I ended up finding some documentaries as well. Um, I bought a book off of Amazon. I think there's always something. Just libraries, before you even go to, like straight to books, you should try libraries first. Definitely yeah. try libraries first. And don't just look for books. Try and look for journals, articles, um, you know, collections, stuff. Stuff like so that. Um, I um I used to work, or I, I do still have a library qualification. I'm just not using it at the moment. But I'm I worked as a librarian, so I can say that um a lot of if you have access to a university library, 100% use it because they have amazing resources you'll get nowhere else. Mm -hmm. If you don't have access to one, a lot of those resources are very difficult to get because um, academic mm -hmm. publishing is predatory, and I hate how it it ethically practices. That's another long story. I won't go into it. But if you want to find um useful stuff there's a website called jstor j-s-t-o-r as um an independent researcher you can download up to 100 articles a month i don't know how long that will last go take advantage of that um it has loads of sort of um interesting academic and humanities articles yeah. um google scholar which is scholar.google.com you can search with keywords so say you're doing something on um, the moogle period you can type in moogle history or, or mm. something or moogle history women perhaps and it will bring up some articles and if there is a free pdf it will find it for you um your local library can often get you things if, if they're not otherwise available mm. um another thing that you can do which is not like an academically suggested thing but is probably useful if you're just researching is if you find a wikipedia article about something that you like or find interesting look at the um, references and if you find a book in the references you can probably find that on amazon and probably in the recommended reading it will have more books that are similar mm -hmm. um so you can start kind of from there yeah um and that that's kind of my summary of doing research so i will now shut up um if you so do also like can get documentaries and stuff they Documentaries are great. Yeah. Um, and a lot of those are on YouTube because people put them there. <laughs> so it looks like we probably got time for one more question one more. if we're quick. Um, yeah. Let's see if there's any that we're like super excited about. Um, how about uh, we could talk about our favorite books. I think we always love talking about our favorite books. If you like. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to go oh. first? I guess so. <laughs> now I can't think of anything. Um, oh no, what have I just read? I just finished, an, the problem is I've just finished an advanced reader copy of a book which isn't out for ages, so I'm not going to recommend it because that would be pointless. Um, but uh, we've talked about The Unbroken, I think that's great, um, by C.L. Clark. Really good if you like our books, I think you would really like that one too. That one too. Yeah. yeah. Um, what else am I thinking of? Fireheart Tiger came out recently from Tor and it's a novella and I really enjoyed it. Um, and I've also kind of been reading outside of fantasy a little bit. And so I read Honey Girl by Morgan Rogers. And if you like sort of um, lyrical adult coming of age stories that are very beautiful and deal with mental health and complicated families and love, then that's a really good book. I've been rereading it because I love it so much. Um, yeah, I think... So I don't really talk a lot about favorite um, mm -hmm. books because um, because I tend to like be more of like a work person. Like I read this thing, like I really liked it as opposed to like, mm -hmm. um, um, but I think what I would say is the last thing that I've read uh, or I'm, I'm close to finishing that I loved is also what I'm reading right now. So I guess I'm answering the other question as well which is uh, a master of gin. I think I have it right here. 
Oh, I really want to read that. <laughs> yeah. Is it is All it right. as good as I think it is? It is, isn't it? It, it yeah. is. It is really good. Uh, P. J. D. Clark. For for a while though, um, J. J. D. Clark has really been like um, always by for me um, because I've mm -hmm. read like a bunch of stuff. But um, yeah, a Master of Jin is like really good. Um, if you don't, if you can't read this one, um, Tor has a story out. Um, so like this is like a story in a world that has two novellas that come that came before it and a short story. Um, and so I think it's the ha haunting of tram car. Um, I can't remember the number. There's a number after after tr tram car. Um, but yeah. <laughs> oh, but <laughs> I'm sure if they type that in, they'll yeah, find if it. You find yeah. that, you'll find it. Um, there's a story. Um, I think it's a dead gin in Cairo that's already free on tour. So if you go read that story and you like that story, then you like a master of gin. Um, and and yeah, I think it's just the way. Uh, there's something about the way he like melds like historical. Um, oh interests, right, yeah. in like fantasy, um, yeah, that's it. So I think that we've had a, we're almost at exactly the right time. So <laughs> I think we did really well. I've really, yeah. really enjoyed this. I've, you know, I really loved your first book. I really loved this one. So it's been really nice to chat. Yeah. And um, <laughs> thank you to everyone who came to listen to us talk. We really appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is really, really great. Thank you, Tasha, for um moderating this very expertly <laughs> <laughs> well i had a really good time um so same take care